the writer strike is no longer. Um, we still have to support our SAG after members and, and, and friends and, and um, you know, hope that they can get something resolved here pretty soon. But uh, welcome, everybody. I, I'm just getting right into it. We're, we're going to go for a pretty short amount of time in terms of the amount of material that we're going to cover today. Um, but welcome as everybody files in. Please feel free to share your comments and say hello. Let me know where you're hailing from. I love seeing where everyone is currently sitting as they're watching these uh, free webinars that the ISA puts on every month, virtually every month. I think we take a little time off during the summer and then and late in the year, but um, I enjoy doing these. These are free. They won't always be free, everyone. Coming next year, there will be slight changes um, to the uh, uh, the classes and how we're doing all these webinars, but don't worry. It's not like we're going to be you know, charging an arm and a leg. It's going to be kind of a part of a membership. But anyway, please let me know where you're hailing from. I like seeing the contacts or comments. I'm currently in Wisconsin. Um, Scott, our producer of the show, is also in Wisconsin. We have a pretty strong uh, Wisconsin representation here. Hello from Brooklyn. Good to see you. Um, but uh, South Africa, see, this is why I love seeing this. This is so cool. I love that you're in South Africa right now. I hope it isn't too late <laughs> in the evening. Um, but um, yeah, anyway, my name is Max Tim. I'm the director of education for the International Screenwriters Association. I'm also a consultant, just in case you have never tuned into these before, or if you're seeing the recording on, of this on YouTube uh, or through our pro tips and tricks um, uh, portion of the uh, website. Chicago, Valerie, good to see some Chicago representation. Uh, Antalya. This is, see, this is so cool, man. Um, but uh, I have my own consulting company called The Story Farm. A lot of you already know me, but um, I hope this isn't the first webinar that you have seen or, and, or you were going to watch more because all of my previous webinars are either on the ISA's YouTube channel or through the ISA website. You can watch it either way. Um, I believe these become available only to connect members on the ISA website later, but there, there's, there's so much material on the ISA's YouTube page, whether it's this particular, just me talking to the camera kind of class situation, um, or me interviewing other people, please subscribe to the ISA's YouTube channel. Um, that's not just because we want to get the likes in the subscribes and all, like you see all the time in, in <laughs> YouTube videos. It's because it's a free resource of education and I scream it at the roof to the from the rooftops what's the term all the time um we as writers need to be educating ourselves as much as possible um not only from a sense of, of of actual creative you know and writing education but in terms of what's going on in the industry as much as possible um greetings from monson maine by way of chicago all right cool hello from santa monica mugs good to see you um pretty exciting news yesterday the writer strike is over 12:01 a.m. this morning, as of in, in you know Los Angeles time. Um, very good news. It seems like all the the deal points that are coming through are, are very positive and optimistic for writers in general. Um, <clears throat> I will not be able to answer a ton of questions in terms of the strike, um, but I am going to have about 15 minutes or so at the end of this lecture. Um, where I'm happy to answer as many questions as you have. I am not an expert on all the deal points that came through and what it means for WGA writers or even what it means for pre-WGA writers. I think my best piece of advice can be everything's going to completely blow up right now and it's going to be extremely busy <laughs> from an industry standpoint. If you have intentions to try to find representation and reach out you know, through cold outreach to see if people are looking to take on new writers, please take your time because all agents and managers right now it's like the, all the papers on their desk just suddenly flew up into the air and now they have a lot to take care of. So just take your time if you are looking for representation. Um, greetings from South Africa, Santa, Santa Monica, Indianapolis. Uh, I love seeing it all. Um, okay, let's get started here. I'm going to be talking about outlining, but I want to jump into something that we should be doing before the outlining phase. Um, I, I will say what I'm going to be covering today is a lot, and it's good that this is being recorded. Like Scott said the replay for this is going to be free for a week after you know we go live here and then it's going to be connect only on the isa's uh, website so take advantage of watching the replay here because i'm going to go through a ton of information um very quickly usually the information i have in terms of how i walk through uh, walk writers through the outlining process is a month or months plural long process so <laughs> this is going to be a lot but i want you to get an overview because i do try to push writers to outline in some form um, whatever they're comfortable with before getting to the pa to pages. 
Not every writer works that way. A lot of writers just want to try to get to pages, work through the, the story and their characters in the scenes themselves. That is totally fine. You're not wrong if you do that. Um, but if you stay a little too attached to the scenes that you write in the pages before going, you know, going through the outlining uh, process, that's where you're going to come into problems. And you're going to end up going through you know, 30, 35 pages of a screenplay, loving every second of it. But then you get stuck and realize, I don't know where I'm going. And then you hate the, the script and you think you're a terrible writer. And then you think about quitting. And it, we don't want that. I'm exaggerating a little bit. Also speaking from personal experience, <laughs> we, we tend to get a little too excited about writing interior, you know, greasy spoon night and you get into the, all the, the fun nitty gritty of the, of the actual visuals and the dialogue and stuff. That's all an incredibly important part of the process. We don't need to do that so quickly. We do need to start visualizing the meaning behind things and who these characters are and what they have to experience in order to learn something because that's how the audience learns something. We do need to start seeing these scenes before we're actually writing the scenes. And that's really what the outlining process is meant to do. It's to help us see this thing, this huge project, whether it's a TV series or a movie, before you're writing the, the scenes. And the only real way I think to do that is through some form of an outlining process. My outlining process goes, it, it, it combines character development with structure. I, I, don't, I don't think you can beat out a story without having a full understanding of who this character is that is going to then experience the story. And character and plot are completely married perfectly together. You know, there, there's, you don't have plot without character. You don't really have a character without plot. That could be argued, but structure is where character and plot live okay i think that's where we need to, to be but i'm going to start first with some questions that i think are so important and they help me when i'm trying to work through any kind of either creative development on a you know a rewrite for a writer uh, or some of my own projects um, and i'm going to share my screen and these are going to be that is not what i want um you would think after all the experience that I have working uh, on webinars <laughs> that I would be able to perfectly organize the materials I'm going to share on the screen here. That is not always the case. Okay, sharing my screen, I wanna show some character development questions for you all. These are really simple, really basic, but what I can't stress enough is that we have to spend time digging into these questions, okay? Now, obviously, this has nothing to do with outlining. And I think that's a little bit of a problem with the word. You know, we, we as writers, our paintbrush is a word and words plural. You know, that's all we have to work with. And sometimes a word can trip us up. When we think of outlining, we think we have to go from, you know, some kind of a beat sheet or we have to go, you know, Roman numeral one and we, you know, first act and you have the form kills us. So let's just get rid of the idea of what it, an outline is supposed to look like. Outlining in general is just breaking a story as they call it in a writer's room. So forget about form. These are questions that are a part, part of your outlining process. Really straightforward, but I can't, again, I can't stress enough how important they are. Pretty straightforward, first question. Who's our main character? What's that character's flaw? What we need to do with flaw is consider it from a place of how does the flaw help me as the writer create moments and scenes, not just some kind of character sketch. Character sketches are important. We need to know the backstory and background of who this person is, um, where they came from, what are their wounds? Very important because a wound is what technically creates the flaw, but you know, what created the wound, all those things are very important, but the backstory is, is backstory. It's not our current story. So what we want to do with flaw, we want to consider it as something deeper, that's creating the personal issues in her life and at least two words that present a little bit of a sweet and sour, positive, negative feeling to the overall flaw, a good and a bad. So, and I'm making a little point here, refer to the flawless PDF I sent you. I should have removed that for this class because <laughs> I used this for my online retreat that I held two weekends ago um, that uh, I did share <laughs> that PDF, which I am not going to share with everybody here. But anyway, um, you're taking in, in a fun little exercise, two words that you think describe this character, but they have like, when you put them together, it's not all just terrible, you know, selfish narcissist. Well, you know, that 
that's horrible. <laughs> the, the thing about a flaw is that most characters, if not all characters, when we come into the story and we meet them, they're living with this flaw. And it's probably in some ways kind of working for them. And it's not just straight evil or bad or all negative. They, we all have flaws ourselves. We're not bad or evil people. So we really want to think about who this person is in terms of a sweet and a sour, you know, um, recklessly selfless or um, um, <laughs> I had another one and I can't remember. Um, naively ambitious, you know what I mean? Like naive is kind of bad, but ambitious can be good. When you put them together, oh, I'm kind of starting to see a little bit of a dichotomy, but they're also words that help you then create this list of moments and scenes that show the character set in that flaw. So in a way, you're kind of getting to a beat sheet from just a reference to the character's flaw, but the beat sheet isn't concerned with when these beats are going to happen. I don't even like the term beat sheet. So just kind of scratch that from your memory, right? I hate the term beat sheet. Beat, it's another, it's a word that is just too confusing. There are so many beats just within a moment. There are so many beats within a scene. There are so many beats within an overall sequence. So just forget about the word beat. It's a list of moments and scenes that show the character in the flaw. You're not worried about dialogue. You're not worried about who the other person necessarily might be in, in, the, uh, in the scene or the moment. We want to see this character set in that flaw in some way. Then also create a basic list of moments or windows into who the main character is without creating a scene or a moment. In other words, bedside clock, posters on the wall, the clothing, type of car, tattoos. This can be a day or two or a week long process for you. If you really want to dig in and do this for all the primary characters in your story, it's a lot of fun because it's, it's totally free. You don't have to worry about when these things are happening free as in I'm not restricted by format. You know, it, it really helps from a place of starting to see what the story could, could be and what it could look like literally. And I, I took this exercise um, quite literally where I, I thought, okay, I'm going to write an entire screenplay almost entirely based on this idea where I'm going to take a particular character and I'm jumping into basic plot goal a little bit here. Um, but I'm going to take a particular type of character where I've done all this work in terms of moments that show who this character is. And then I'm going to place that character into a situation that that character would never want to be in because of the flaw. And it, that situation then immediately starts drawing out this character's flaw. So I had this very risk averse, uh, romantically hopeless history nerd um, who just wants to be happy with a, a partner like he just wants to find a girlfriend <laughs> it's really all he wants emotionally but he's extremely risk averse to the point where he's never traveled um he would never you know take any major risks so i put him into a situation where he is then forced to go on a an extreme sports contest tour through europe from the uk down to the south of france um with a, a his lifelong best friend who is kind of his opposite so just from that basic idea of a concept, I started to see all these moments that could play out. I didn't really have a, a plot goal necessarily set up. I, I you know, started to come from a little bit of a fun adventure comedy place, but I just started to see moments from there. Then answer the question of what's the basic plot goal and really keep it basic. Don't go into this long explanation of what this character needs to pursue and, and what, you know, with the st obvious stakes will just kind of be inherent, but don't worry about it being so specific to that character. It's just, th there are seven basic plot goals in virtually any story. Rescue, find, or retrieve being one. It's an escape plot goal. Defeat or stop. Seek truth or justice. Learn and put use uh, to help or save. So you're learning something to then put it to use in order to help or save something, uh, convince someone of something, navigate a new world with challenges. That one is pretty basic. Uh, that usually navigate a new world is combined with some of these other plot goals. And yes, like my note is saying, your story can have more than one of these. So just to find, I want to write an escape movie with this type of character. From there, you can start thinking, well, where is that person escaping from? Why is that person escaping? 
um, what are they, is there like, you know, an end result at the end of the escape, they have to get out of the city and get to Wyoming or, you know, whatever. Um, just keep it really basic. Then you really want to dig into what the main character's emotional goal is. What do they personally want, desire, wish for? Why can't they have it? So that is, has nothing to do with plot. Keep that totally separate. Kind of like my little character uh, sketch of, of my adventure comedy character where he really just wants a girlfriend. He just wants to be in a relationship. There's more to it than that, but that's how I just broke, broke it down in a really simplified form. You then put that into this a basic plot goal for me, which was this extreme sports contest tour. It's like a history tour through Europe, but they have to jump out of planes and they have to, you know, whitewater river raft and joust like three stories up. It's just completely ridiculous, almost like an amazing race kind of experience. And um, just all of those moments started popping into my head. Like this type of character would, it would be so much fun to see in those experiences. Meanwhile, when I got into this main character emotional goal, the tour guide, of course, is this extremely athletic, mysterious woman that the main character falls head over heels for. And they are, they could not be more different. <laughs> like they are not right for each other. But of course, this, this character, of course, is romantically hopeless. So of course, he develops this huge crush on the tour guide. All of these things started to come out. And you start to see that even though I'm doing primarily character-oriented brainstorms, the story comes out from it, especially when you, you really figure out a basic plot goal. Just keep it really simple. Then you want to do the same things with your opponent, villain. The reason I have a little hash uh, slash here is because you do want to define the type of antagonist that you have. Another word for me where it comes to screenwriting and, and storytelling, it's a little too broad. Antagonist is just the root word is to antagonize. So it does, an, an antagonist isn't necessarily always an Ursula from The Little Mermaid, you know, or, or Hans Gruber from um, Die Hard, you know, these, these kind of world domination type of characters. Those are villains. An opponent could just be Sally in When Harry Met Sally. She's opposing Harry. She's antagonizing him. So you wanted to be able to define that. If you if you have a romantic comedy, you're not going to have a straight villain, unless there's some form of a genre mix in there. Um, anyway, this is a really important question. What is their motive? Like, why are they doing this? What? Why are they attempting to do this thing? In other words, what is their basic plot goal? So you want to make sure that that opponent is connected to its own plot goal. Um, but then what's, why are they attempting to do this emotionally? What's going, why do they feel they need to do this? Um, and it, I, I like the idea of an empathetic um, opponent, meaning we understand that they are bad, or if you have a villain, evil, for this reason, something happened to them, or they feel that they've been cheated, or, you know, you want to get into a personal motive and a plot goal motive for the opponent or villain. Secondary character, really broad term for basically the second lead uh, in the story who isn't the direct opponent. So in a really basic sense where you have hero and mentor, Luke and Obi-Wan, uh, Frodo and Gandalf, or even Frodo and Sam, um, obvious choices there. But if you look at 40-year-old Virgin, you have Steve Carell's character, and he has multiple secondary characters in terms of his so-called friends, <laughs> his co-workers who are forcing him on these dates. So we want to be wondering, how does that character emotionally affect the main character? And that's where you can go into a freehand writing of because this secondary character is this way. In other words, you could do the, this question for your secondary character and this all this work. Um, just because this main character is this particular way, this, this they have this personality, they're this type, they're going to naturally affect the main character. The, a perfect example is Finding Nemo, where you have Marlon and Dory. You have Marlon, who is so set in his ways, he's incredibly overprotective, and he cannot let go of anything. So the perfect secondary character is Dory, who quite literally lets go of everything every five minutes. She, she has memory loss. <laughs> She can't remember anything. So when you look at that di dynamic, now I'm like, okay, I understand who this secondary character is from the point of how she is going to affect Marlon. But then you also want to be thinking, what does the secondary character physically do to affect the main character's pursuit? They're probably going on this adventure with this main character, but you want to list some things. The 40 year old virgin is a perfect example. They're quite literally forcing Steve Carell on dates. So, 
it's easy looking at exaggerated uh, examples, but when you then compare it to your current projects, whether it's a rewrite or a brand new project, um, these are important questions. Now, if you combine the plot goal and the emotional goal, so basic plot goal with our main character's flaw, but more importantly, emotional goal, my, this is just an example of another script that I wrote that has never gone anywhere. <laughs> so I use it for educational purposes. Um, but Charlie wants a family and to feel that he's enough. It's his emotional goal. While the plot goal, having to defeat or stop a crazy scientist from traveling through time and changing history. What does that look like? A logline. Obviously, it's not quite enough. But you're now getting into, wow, if I put when and then and until into there, I start to have a structure of of when things actually happen and what those mo moments might be. So you're starting to get into what the traditional idea of outlining is, even though you're not working through some kind of Roman numeral BS of, you know, in a form you're, you're, you're coming at in a way, structural brainstorming strictly through character. Yes. Of course you're working through plot goal um, and, and, you know, the plot structure of defeat or escape or whatever. Um, but it's from a place of character. And then I think this is a big one. How does the correction of the flaw show the main character arc and therefore what message or theme can be expressed from that arc and flaw correction? This is a much bigger kind of esoteric, you know, consideration for you and your story. But theme is directly attached and tied to how that main character changes. Because what we really want to remember about this emotional goal, the character's they, they, you've probably all heard it, but you know, there's a difference between want versus need. A character thinks they want something, right? Steve Carell thinks he just, he just wants to have sex because he's never had sex before. And he thinks this is, this is all he needs, really. He thinks it's a need. Um, so that want is pursued, the emotional want, but he finds that he actually needed something else. And that's for him to just come to appreciate himself, to respect himself, to feel comfortable with who he is. And that then in turn will allow him to find love. It wasn't just the sex that he wanted. So there's a difference between want and need. And there's a theme in there. And it's all incredibly relative to your own story. But you can, and you don't, don't worry about platitudes like love conquers all. You can just express what does my story mean? Why am I showing this story? What do I want audiences to get out of this? You know, I want to tell a story about dot, dot, dot. And it doesn't have to necessarily be the specific plot oriented stuff that you've brainstormed. It's just, I want to tell a story what, about what it's like to, you know, be uh, an outsider on your first day of school as a junior in high school or whatever. I mean, there isn't a specific thematic reference in there, but we start to get to tone and, and, and metaphor a little bit. And you, you start digging into what I'm actually trying to say. So those questions are extremely important well before you get into any kind of structure of when things happen. Um, the reason I'm s slowing down my speech <laughs> is because I know how much information I'm about to dump on all of you. So that was a lot and you're, I'll stop sharing my screen and you can go back and watch the replay here. I'm not going to send over that, those questions or anything. Um, and you're welcome T. Um, she really appreciates this, but um, I'm not going to send that document over. You can rewatch the, the, the replay and you can write those questions down. What I'm about to share is a pretty long document. Um, and I don't even know if I'm going to put it on screen because it's just going to be too much for all of you to read. Um, what I will share is an example of what an outline, a beginning, like first draft of an outline can look like um, in a really basic form. But I'm going to go through. I want to try to get this right. So I, uh, your brains are all going to explode if you haven't heard this before. And that's not because I think what I'm saying is so brilliant. I swear. It's just, this is a lot to learn. It's take, I've spent what, almost 18 years now memorizing all of this. And so I'll, I'm just going to go through, through quickly. So to give a broad stroke approach first, I look at story from a 12 sequence approach. It's a little bit easier to fit it mathematically where a movie is concerned because you have, you know, 110 pages, maybe 120, but Please don't write a 120 page script. It's just too long, um, but it works out mathematically uh, if you consider it from a 12 sequence approach. The, these 12 sequences that I'm going to go through in detail, they fit into TV, whether it's half hour or hour long, 
it's just the number of pages each sequence actually is is, is much much shorter um but if we look at a movie you have three acts right act one two three if you break that down in a really basic sense 30 pages for the first act 60 pages for the second act 30 pages for the third act it is never that perfect um, and you do not need it to be that way your your third act like when when harry met sally that third act was like maybe 15 pages it was a really short third act the second act was quite long so don't worry about the math fitting perfectly but from this the sense of then dividing it in a way by 12 you can you can look at these 12 sequences where if you have three sequences in the first act each sequence is roughly 10 pages long that makes up 30 pages and there are certain things that should happen within that first act and if you organize it in terms of my sequence one has these particular types of moments or events or scenes and then same with sequence two same with sequence three now i can use the sequential order of what's supposed to happen and i'm using heavy air quotes um, because this is not a perfect formula, but I can use that to brainstorm. I can actually say, okay, well, sequence one is supposed to contain elements of seeing the stage of life my main character is in. Stage of life meaning they're about to turn 16, uh, they were just fired, um, their boyfriend breaks up with them, um, watch Legally Blonde. I'll just say that if you really want to study sequences, Legally Blonde perfectly follows the exact structure of what I'm about to go through. Um, but you want to show stage of life, um, the arena overall, you know, what, where does this character live? Is it 1963 suburbs of Chicago or is it the moon or, you know, <clears throat> the eighties on Venice beach or, you know, whatever it is, you want to get a sense of the arena. Um, you want to make sure that we show the character's flaws. It's really, it's an entire sequence up to maybe 10 pages. You could go maybe a little longer, but it's like eight to 10 where we just really get a sense of who we're dealing with. Who is our main character and who are the other players in, in, in the story? Um, but we want to see them living in their normal world. They're really, they have not met the plot yet. You know, it's, it's argued <laughs> because every movie is different, but the main character has not necessarily met the plot yet. You can introduce the audience to certain plot elements. Maybe we see the opponent or villain really early on. We see the major threat. Um, Stranger Things is a good example for TV where that first opening scene was all plot. There's this crazy you know, scientist who is absolutely terrified running down this spooky hallway. He runs into an elevator, obviously trying to get away from something, and he's pulled up through the ceiling of the elevator by a monster, like some obvious horrible creature. That's all plot. <clears throat> we have no introduction to the main character or characters yet, but the audience has just been introduced to what? The arena, the um, a little bit of of time period, even though you couldn't necessarily tell it was in the 80s. The opening credits kind of told you it was in the 80s. But um, there's a major threat. It's science fiction. So there's genre representation, maybe a little fantasy involved, all within the first, what, 12 seconds? You know, I don't even know if the scene was that long. So yes, that's a way to introduce plot in your first sequence. We're not connecting the main character to it yet. It's more important to show who this character is as a personality type, what they want, what they desire, what they wish for. So important, because if we don't have that foundation as a reader or an audience, how are we then going to connect the level of importance to the plot? Then it just becomes all plot and it just doesn't you know, like I don't really care. You know, it could be interesting and fun, um, but it, it isn't emotional. Sequence two, then again, each sequence, let's just make it really easy. Each sequence is 10 pages. They're not technically all 10 pages, but we'll just keep it easy. The next set of 10 pages, sequence two. This is what a lot of people call the inciting incident. I call it a new opportunity and a series of setups because it doesn't have to be just one incident. It doesn't have to be one moment that sets up the entire plot. You have a series of setup events that occur that ultimately allows for the main character to see that there's an opportunity to pursue something. They may not want the opportunity. <laughs> Steve Carell does not want to be placed on dates. Um, or it's Luke Skywalker, where he's like, I have an opportunity to leave, even though my parents or well, my parents are dead, or actually aunt and uncle, whatever. Um, my family is dead. I don't have anywhere to live. I want to go. That may not happen exactly between pages 10 and 20, but it's the setup event and it's a series of events. He then, of course, meets Obi-Wan in sequence three so sequence three <clears throat> is the secondary character introduction but don't read into that deliberately or literally you can have that secondary character be introduced 
in the first sequence or the second sequence. A lot of times that secondary character actually presents the plot opportunity in that second sequence. Um, but the third sequence is really where you see how that secondary is going to affect the main character. That, that secondary's role is going to be pronounced, but for the purpose of emotional and relationship presentation, so-called. You're establishing that there is this is also a relationship story that we're going to follow whether it's a friendship or it's a love affair or whatever it might be, we do not want to forget in our stories that one of the main reasons we all as audience members like watching movies or reading stories is because of the evolution of the relationships that go through and happen during the plot. It's not just a plot setup. So the third sequence is the end that's ending your uh, first act. So we, let's say we have 30 pages in your first act. We're setting up main character stage of life, their flaws, you know, uh, wants, desires, wishes, we get that setup event or series of events where it's presenting a new opportunity to pursue something based on what we, the audience, just experienced in those prior 10 pages of what this character thinks they want. Now there's an opportunity to go get it. I'm highly summarizing and, and oversimplifying, <laughs> but that's the general effect. In that third sequence, we're making sure that secondary character is presented in terms of who that person is going to be in the life of the main character. Don't forget, though, that we also need to have a feeling by the end of that third sequence that there's now a plan in place. They're going to pursue something. That word pursuit is really important. The main character is pursuing something, whether it's willingly or reluctantly, there is a goal of some kind. And it could be something very simple, simple like a ladybird where it's a very low concept. She just wants to leave and not be under the shadow of her mom. And she wants to experience life. We understand that that's what she wants by the end of the first act. We don't necessarily know what she's going to do to get that or gain that or have that experience. But we, we understand, okay, I can sit back in my theater chair and just kind of go for a ride here. Let's see how this goes. In National Treasure, it's extremely obvious. <laughs> he says, we're going to steal the Declaration of Independence. Oh, okay. So I guess I'm going to watch you now in the next set of sequences, try to steal the declaration. <laughs> he says it. So <clears throat> depending on the type of project you have, we want to make sure by the end of the first act, we know what we, the audience, are going to experience. The fourth sequence begins your second act. So your, your second act in a movie, we'll just do it for a movie for now because it's easier to see it uh, just from a mathematical standpoint. Your second act has six sequences. So first act, three sequences. Second act is six sequences. Your third act then is going to have three sequences. Um, starting with the fourth sequence. So we've got sequence four being fun and games. This is just that don't take fun and games again, literally where it's only positive, happy stuff. Because if you're writing a horror movie, probably not a whole lot of fun and games going on. But it's this feeling of the character experiencing a new world. Sometimes it's literally a new world. But ultimately, and more overall, it's a new situation that they're in. They have not experienced this situation before. That's extremely important. Um, there are no major problems or obstacles. There are obstacles they have to get over, but they get over them relatively easily. But with the help of the secondary character, especially moving then into sequence five, real obstacles are introduced. But now we see the, the main character and secondary character actually kind of coming together. We're, we're really seeing their relationship form. Um, we're reminded that this is also about a particular relationship, you know, the story. Um, and the main, I'm just reading my notes. Yeah, they're working together on the same team, coming closer, learning and attempting to apply the new lessons as they're going. We're still in the training ground, though. That main character through these first five sequences, they are not changing their flaw. They're not, you know, doing some kind of big 180 to change. They're still who they are and have always been in this pursuit toward achieving something alongside whoever their secondary character is or multiple secondary characters. Once we then get into the sixth sequence, with, which marks the midpoint, that's the big complication. It's a huge twist. It's a big fork in the road. Um, it's a point of no return. Something happens or multiple things happen that changes everything. They were going in one direction, pursuing, you know, whatever kind of goal they have, working together. And you either have an early victory, like it seems like they may have just achieved their goal um, without having to change, by the way, like emotionally. The main character is like, 
I just did it. It doesn't happen a lot, but you see it sometimes. It's like a happy midpoint. Um, or it's an early low point where they attempted to do something, but it, everything, it, it was like an early failure, or there's a huge piece of information that comes out or a reveal um, that now how they were going to pursue they, their goal, they can no longer do it this way. And that has a very real, and this is, we cannot forget this in our midpoint, this goes for a half hour drama or, or uh, an hour long drama or even a half hour comedy a little bit. Um, there's an emotional change in that character. There's, this is an emotional effect that the character is going through because of whatever this complication is. <clears throat> then moving into sequence seven, this sequence six kind of marks the, like the, if you look at the second act, you have two halves of your second act. Okay. And that first half sequences four, five, and a little bit of six. And then the second half is kind of like a little bit of six into sequence of seven and eight. If you really want to look at it perfectly from a mathematical standpoint, it's like act two and act two or act two A and act two B. Act two A is the adventure portion where they're just pursuing their goal. It's actually in some ways seemingly working out. They're coming together with a relationship. It's still difficult. It's not like they're just easily zooming through things. There are still obstacles, but they're overcoming them. Something happens then at the midpoint that changes the adventure into a journey. And the word journey compared to the word adventure, journey naturally has more of a dramatic con connotation to it. Like this isn't easy anymore. You know, this, if I go on a hike, I would prefer it's an adventure, <laughs> not a journey, because I don't want to come back bloodied and, and beaten up because like, Jesus, I just went on a journey, you know. So you want to think of the second half of your second act in that way. Things now are not going to be like they were. Everything's different. But the main character and one of the main reasons it's difficult in your journey portion is because the main character, whether they're aware of it or not, is refusing to change. They're pushing. They're not allowing. You know, they, they were pushing in the first act or first half of the second act. Now, in the second half of the second act, in most stories and even in life, if you allow things to happen, it'll be easier. You, you know, if you, the whole analogy, if you try to you know, hold water in your hand, it's just going to fall through. You can't force it. It's a forceful nature to the emotional impact of the second half of the second act. And that character is pushing. So in sequence seven, we have a little bit of a honeymoon period. And the honeymoon period doesn't have to be positive. Like it, it could be a honeymoon period because in the sixth sequence, they think they achieved what they achieved. They got the girl, however you want to look at it, um, you know, in a cliched sort of way. Um, or it didn't work out. And now in the seventh sequence, the honeymoon period is them responding to the previous failure and now making a new plan and pushing forward. Regardless of what happens by the end of the seventh sequence, you're probably around page 60 if you want to look at it mathematically perfectly, maybe page 70, whatever. Um, the rug is pulled out from under them, regardless, by the end of that seventh sequence. They think everything's working great. You have this cheesy montage of you know, a couple running on the beach and they're happy and blah, blah, blah. Or you have like this main character kind of you know pissed off and angry and he's like, I have a new plan and we're going to make this happen. The secondary character probably doesn't agree. Um, and we're going to do this, but then they maybe have one attempt and it doesn't work. And now the, the, the main character is like, holy shit, what am I going to do? I see now that the opponent, especially in sequence eight, and, and that's where I'm calling it. The opponent takes charge in sequence eight, the opponent starts to win. Like now that opponent is really, you're getting a sense that this is not going to end well because the main character is failing and they're refusing to change. We are then leading up to sequence nine, which is marking the end of your second act. And that's the low point. Every movie, every story has some kind of low point that's lower than the other low points. <laughs> you can have a lot of low points in your story, but the true low point in sequence nine, the end of your second act in a feature, um, everything falls apart. This and, and what we don't want to forget is that we have to make the main character actively responsible in some way for creating the low point in a lot of ways it's the main character's fault that it fails that whatever they were trying to achieve it didn't work um we don't want a passive low point where everything just happens to your main character because you could very easily argue as the main if you were the main character that you could just fall into victim mode and it's like well all these bad things happened to me i didn't create this so i'm not going to change because I didn't make the low point. So we the whole purpose of any story is for the main character to be confronted with extremely real difficulty per who they are. It doesn't mean that it has to be 
blanket statement, universal life ending, meaning everyone would agree this is awful. We as the audience just have to agree that this is bad for that character. And Steve Carell's journey, you know, of the 40 year old virgin, is it really that big of a deal if you haven't had sex by age 40? You know, it's something you might want to experience, <laughs> but it's not life altering. This is not world ending. But to him, we knew building up to that low point, this is a big deal. And so, and really the low point isn't necessarily just him not having sex. It's him in his failure of attempting to be someone different who may be the type that has sex a lot, you know? And, and so he finds that this is not me. And for him personally, that's a, that's a huge failure. Like I created all these relationship problems and I hurt someone that I care about because I was trying to be somebody else. And so that's personally and emotionally a big deal for him. Regardless, that marks your second act. We want that second act, the ending of your second act, to feel like, where are we going to go now? Like, how could you possibly come out of this uh, as an audience? We want to be thinking, wow, this is this is rough, you know? Sequence 10, then, is usually the shortest sequence. This is the beginning of your third act. It's probably a scene. This is why it doesn't perfectly fit. We're 10 pages for every sequence. Um, because the sequence 10 is dark night of the soul it's, it's reverting back to the original flaw if they were an alcoholic at the beginning of the movie and maybe this is a horribly off you know um, example but we'll use it for exaggerated purposes um if the character is an alcoholic at the beginning of the story they quit during the middle by the 10th sequence after the low point they start drinking again it, it's way too obvious of, and, and basic of an example there's of course much more to that but nonetheless there's they're wallowing they're wallowing in their self-pity they're basically refusing to change like they're they aren't learning from all of what they've just experienced and you know the visual i have in my head is this person just kind of sitting up against some grimy gross wall in an alley and their feet are feet are just kind of you know spread out and they're just sitting there and they're victim how many scenes do we really need to show that it's like one maybe two you know it's just reminding the the audience that this character had a real emotional problem that they were refusing to face up to. And now they're back in it. But we then come into sequence 11, which again is usually a pretty short sequence, a scene or two, but it's much more robust in terms of the purpose. I call it the rallying of the troops or rally the troops sequence. Another character, a secondary character, either physically comes along in, your, in that sequence and it kind of a bootstraps moment for that main character lifts that character up off the ground and reminds that character what they're fighting for sometimes it's literal and physical the character comes along and, and presents a new plan of a you know plot plan but with emotional resonance meaning this is who you're supposed to be and what you sh are supposed to be doing from you know a, a conscience level not just purposeful from a plot standpoint and so the main character is like you're right we're going to do this different um, it's also it, going back to sequence nine, I forgot to mention this <laughs> in sequence nine in that low point, oftentimes you have an estrangement between the main character and the secondary character in Lord of the Rings, uh, Star Wars, Obi-Wan literally dies. Like there's a quite literal <laughs> estrangement. Luke wasn't directly involved in Obi-Wan's death. But because of who Luke has been and who he's been trying to become and how he's become rebellious, Obi-Wan felt he had, he had to fight Darth Vader to show Luke you can do this on your own, you know, typical mentor type of decision. In sequence 11, there, there are reminders and you even hear a voiceover from Obi-Wan, use the force, Luke. So you have even in that case an outside force, even though Obi-Wan's dead, reminding Luke what you're fighting for and why. Um, so there's this new plan is devised, but with an emotional resonance of importance that here's who you're supposed to actually be. They don't necessarily know exactly whether or not this is going to work sometimes, you know, but then we move into the 12th sequence, which is the end of the movie. This is not your epilogue. This is not everything being tied up in a bow. You actually have the big battle scene in the 12th sequence. It could be a series of battles, of course. And a battle does not necessarily have to be, you know, Game of Thrones kind of shit. Like this, this, you can, it's Harry running from his apartment to get to the party to then confront Sally and tell him exactly how or tell her exactly how he feels. It's the first time where he's fully vulnerable. And it's the one thing that he was really ever unwilling to do 
to be vulnerable to the whole story and to admit that he actually is capable of loving someone. Um, maybe that's not said in the perfect way, but <laughs> nonetheless, there's a battle scene there, right? And so your 12 sequence could be 10 pages. It could be two pages. It, 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 it completely depends on what your big climax needs. But what we have is a statement of theme, whether it's literal, like they actually say the thematic reason for the story, which is kind of cliche. Um, you see it a lot in kind of Disney movies and kids movies and family movies and stuff. Um, or it's shown. It's the character does doing something that that character never would have thought they would have been able to do when we first met them. That there's no way that the character would have done that or said that or or have been able to do that. You know, it's the, the idea of someone being selfish in the beginning and then they're sacrificing themselves in the end. You know, it, it's that type of 180 degree change. Not every story needs 180 degree change. The flaw does not have to be exact opposite by the end. There's at least the opportunity to see that this main character is going to be different from now on. Like at the very end of When Harry Met Sally, where we see Harry and Sally on the couch and they're being interviewed and it's this cute little moment where they're a couple and stuff. Their personalities are still exactly the same. They're still kind of, you know, especially Harry, they're still kind of neurotic and they have a really fun back and forth. But you can, you know that this is going to be healthy. <laughs> going forward because of what Harry went through. Sally changes too, but it's really because of who Sally is, Harry changes. And that's the whole idea of a secondary character in that relationship type. So sequences one through 12, if you can memorize those things in terms of what's supposed to be happening in each sequence, you can apply those sequences, so-called, I'm doing air quotes again, um, into your half hour pilot or into your hour long drama um, they just won't be 10 pages long. Like it, it's the same moments occur. Watch any traditional sitcom, especially like a Friends or a Frasier or a Big Bang Theory or a Mom. Those moments still happen. And they're quite obvious if you know when you're looking for them, but they just happen like two or three of them in terms of like sequence one, two, three. They happen in the A story, B story, C story within like the first four minutes <laughs> because the characters come in. Joey has like a broken arm and a sling and he's like, oh, my God. And he kind of says something dumb and funny. Um, and he then says, I have an audition to be a rock climber today. What am I going to do? I have to lie about my arm. We have all three of the sequence. And then some other character comes in. He's like, oh, well, I'll help you lie. <laughs> I'm making this up. We have all three of those first sequences happening within uh, less than a scene. And, but they're still happening. And then you have it happen in the B story and then it happens in the C story. So it's just about memorizing what's supposed to happen within a story from a sequential order of things and then applying it however you want. From an outlining standpoint, I'll show you just really quickly what a basic rundown of an outline can look like, like the first iteration. And I have about 10 ish minutes or so to go here and we'll, I'll answer questions. But um, that's what I want to show. Yeah. So this is the comedy adventure that I, I wrote. Again, didn't go anywhere using it for educational purposes. <laughs> it's most of my screenplays. Um, but uh, th it's just here's my sequence one summary. You know, and let me bring this up here. Um, sequence one summary. And I'm what I'm using is a little bit of a log line style approach when and there isn't a then, but we, there's kind of like a then in here, even though I'm not stay, saying then. And then we have an until. And so all I'm doing in between the when and then the then <laughs> is describing a, a scene. And then we have then he's fired from his travel agency for a job lashing out at an innocent woman. That's another scene until when he's at the local library, et cetera, et cetera. That's another scene. So I'm highlighting, and I know there are going to be more than three scenes in the first sequence. There are probably five or six or maybe seven if you have one or two that are really small. Um, but I'm highlighting the three primary scenes in those sequences. And it's just a paragraph. I just want to get this down. I kind of see what the story is going to be, but I'm, I'm writing it from a scene standpoint. And then I do the same thing. And this is just the first six sequences. But I'm doing the same thing for the, for the rest of the first half of the, of the movie. What you can then do in the next iteration of your outline is take this highlighted portion, copy it, put it into a new document, and put it at the top of the page. That's the whole page then becomes the kind of worksheet for your sequence one. And so these are the three primary scenes that you're gonna have in your sequence one. But then, and it's just as a reference at the top of the page, 
then the rest, like you can delete all this stuff and it's just an open white page. And then you can just go, okay, scene one, here's my opening image and how I meet, you know, these certain people and then scene two, and I give a description for that scene three description, four, five, whatever. And you're just trying to make a list of what's happening in your first sequence. And it's, even if you don't even know what's going to happen, you can use it as a brainstorming document. Even from there, you'll further, um, give further detail to that page one, sequence one, and you can start writing out the scenes and it, don't worry about formatting. You can kind of get into where, what, you know, what location are they going to be in? Who are they with? Maybe, you know, three or four lines of dialogue. You can basically start writing your screenplay in that format and you're organizing it from a 12 page outline approach. So all of what I want on page one is as many details as I can give in one page about my sequence one. So I'm kind of summarizing the first eight to 10 pages in that page one of the 12 page document. And then I do the same thing throughout all 12. <clears throat> and you could like some of my writers that I've worked with, they ex end up expanding it to like 23, 24, 25 pages where they're really getting detailed and they're using it as your first draft of a screenplay, but they're just not worried about formatting it. I don't care what it looks like in final draft or movie magic screenwriter or whatever. Because something happens to the um, the writer's brain. I'll stop sharing. Um, when we open up a screenplay, a screenplay writing, you know, formatting software, so it, 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 we it, something happens. <laughs> I can't describe it, and I'm sure you all know what that is. But we get stuck in format. We're we're limited by the tabbing. You know, we have to go. Okay, scene heading, and now interior. I have to name this something. And then, okay, do I do a hyphen in the night or do I do evening or maybe it's sunset or maybe it's morning or maybe it's dawn? Like, oh, none of that. We're sitting there for 15 minutes trying to figure out how to write a scene heading. None of it matters. And I mean that quite literally when we haven't even figured out what's going to happen in the story. So use this format in terms of how you can detail an outline with purpose, meaning I'm going to write my first draft of my screenplay in 24 pages, you know, in my, in my outline. Once you're then done with your outline, you know exactly what's going to happen. Then you open up final draft and you're like, okay, let's go to my sequence one, you know, document. And I know my first scene is going to be this cool. Now let's write the scene. I know what it's going to be. I spent all this time detailing the point of the scene and the lines of dialogue and the emotional resonance and, you know, the, some of the visuals. Now I can be really artistic and make some decisions in that page. It makes a huge difference. Um, Sandra's asking, can you remind us again of sequence five? Sequence four and five are somewhat similar. Um, sequence four is like fun and games, new world, kind of the Joseph Campbell idea where they're experiencing the new world for the first time. Um, we see a lot of trailer moments, like the actual movie trailer. A lot of those moments happen, or that we see in the trailer, are come from that first or the fourth sequence because it's a character experiencing a situation for the first time and that's what an audience is doing sequence five is real obstacles are occurring um it isn't so much fun and games anymore but they're overcoming them and most importantly the main character and the secondary character that relationship really starts to to bud you know we they're on the same page they're working together they're coming together um they're moving forward through this obstacle Yes, we're going to, of course, see what the opponent is attempting to do. We don't want to forget about plot situations that are happening within that fifth sequence. But really, the point is to show how the character and the secondary are evolving and moving through this together. Um, let's see here. Any other questions? There was a lot. I told you. I'm sure some of you just kind of sat back and were like, all right, I'm just going <laughs> to I'm gonna stop taking notes. It's a lot. And, and But so is this whole thing that we're doing. You know, like this, this process of writing a story, it's a visceral experience for an audience. It needs to be. And the first audience member is the person who's reading the screenplay. And so we need to do the work up front before we ever get to those pages. Otherwise, we're wasting not only our own time, but everybody else's. And I don't mean to be so harsh or negative, um, but we have to be doing this work up front. Uh, Michael, what about if you're writing a mystery where we don't know who the antagonist is until the end? So from a development standpoint, you yourself, and then this sounds like a really basic answer to that question, you then, you need to know who the, the, the antagonist is, who the villain is, who the person, you know, the murderer might be, um, and start from the end. What might the big, huge reveal be? What might the big climax be? 
that then shows who this murderer is and then work backwards from a place of um, clues. Just It's like a list of clues that could show the audience and the main character especially that this clue could say it's, you know, Colonel Mustard. <laughs> this clue could say that it's actually my opponent. This clue could say, so you'd work through clues and those clues somehow, you know, I'm, I'm making it sound a lot easier than, than it is, become moments and scenes. Where might they find that clue? Why is the clue presented? You know, so it kind of worked backwards from clues. Um, and But that's all plot development. I think the big thing for any mystery, especially in today's marketplace, the mystery needs to be a character oriented journey. It has that character has to go on an emotional roller coaster ride. And we as the audience have to understand that this is a personal story. Look at uh, the first Knives Out. The person who ends up, see, I don't want to give it away if you haven't seen Knives Out. I don't, um, how can I say that? <laughs> the winner <laughs> at the end, even though it's not a competition, um, went through a difficult experience like this was an emotional experience for this person i don't want to give gender away um and we were able to connect with that character you know like that we understood what they were dealing with at least from a universal standpoint on a personal level so it's it's important to work backwards mystery in terms of the plot because the plot is extremely important in a mystery um but we don't want to forget that this is also a character oriented journey. The character is going to be someone different by the end. And the reveal of who that murderer is, let's say, um, is going to be tied to this character's arc. You know, like the, the, it isn't just, ha ha, I win. You know, the, they have to win by going, meaning the uh, main character, by going through something very difficult and doing something that they never thought they could have done. Um, Scott just rewatched Matchstick Men. Um, spoiler here if you haven't seen it. But it was interesting to see someone close to him was an opponent for a long while before becoming a literal antagonist. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of things that you can do to throw the uh, audience off. And I think it's a list of the clues that can really help you um, if those clues actually become scenes or moments or not. And then you can decide, you know, where might they fall and, and based on the idea of, of a sequential order of things. <sighs> that was a lot, even for me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Structure and outlining is, is it's one of the few things in storytelling that we can memorize and just do it the same way from a basic development standpoint up front uh, and early on. It, it's everything then changes and becomes relative. And then you can choose to, well, I'm going to have my midpoint complication happen at page 70, you know, or I'm going to have a series of major twists and complications from page 50 to 70. It, it, you don't have to follow the sequential order and formula perfectly. Um, but it helps you brainstorm. We, we tend to forget that an outline can actually be an exercise and a brainstorming tool and, and not just here's what's going to happen. And I think that, you know, that change in our brain when we're working through the creative process of trying to figure out what does happen, it helps us because it frees us up. Um, so try not to be too stuck in, in making sure you do things exactly as certain consultants or, you know, certain industry professionals have told you to do it. Um, but again, the structural approach can be memorized and then you can change it. And, and, and at least as long as you understand why the certain things that are happening at certain points happen then, you know, from a reason of emotional change for relationship arc, uh, for theme and message. Um, I think we, we tend to, to get so stuck on plot, um, which is, isn't bad. It's just, we, we, you know, if you do it like a percentage, it's like your 70% of my time is figuring out what the plot is when the, that 30% of the character stuff is really what the audience is going to remember. That's how we connect with the story. All right, everybody. I think that's pretty much it. Um, I am, well, I was going to make this big announcement, but I am opening up to take and accept new one-on-one uh, -on -one consulting clients again, um, but for an extremely short period of time. And because I'm going to be discontinuing in 2024 my one-on-one -on -one consulting. I'm going to be shifting much more to classes and live retreats and online retreats. And I won't be taking on new clients. Um, it's the first time I've done that in seven years. Well, obviously, it's the first time I've done that because <laughs> I'm technically closing shop in a way. Um, but uh, so if you do want to work with me, email me, max at thestoryfarm.org. Thank you, Scott. Um, and you can just ask me, you know, what does it entail? Um, how much does it cost? You can go to thestoryfarm.org. 
um, and take a look at what I, you know, what the website looks like. I have anytime call packages that you can purchase. I only work through call packages. Um, if you do want a one-time call and evaluation where I read the whole script and have a call with you, you can do that through the development slate evaluation on the ISA's website. Um, I'll keep it at that. So anyway, if you're looking for somebody to work with, email me and we'll, we'll go from there. All right, everybody. Um, that was jam packed for an hour. I hope it was helpful. Um, three cheers to the WGA and the negotiators and you know, everybody that, you know, they went through even more than we did <laughs> over the past few months. So hopefully things get moving forward. The SAG after thing gets handled soon and the industry is, you know, fully back to, uh, you know, chugging ahead full steam, but keep working hard, everybody. I will be back next month at the end of October. Scott and I might even have a fun little discussion in some way about scary movies We'll, we'll figure it out. Um, if you do want to listen to some um, uh, scary stuff, kind of like Scott's uh, title in the comments. Um, see, it's like saying ghost stories. It says Scott Marcus ghost stories. So Scott, <laughs> Scott has a cool website called what's your ghost story.com. If you want to just kind of anonymously, anonymously put up your, your you know, scary ghost story, but Scott and I also have a podcast uh, called the fantastic story society. You can find it on iTunes and you know, all the different places where you find podcasts. And it's just the two of us interviewing someone who is, is a so-called expert in a very strange field, like in a different type of field. And they have a lot of fun stories to tell. So the Fantastic Story Society, if you want to listen. All right, everybody. Um, I will talk to you soon and see you next month at the end of October. It was amazing. Like it was so, so cool to watch the cast perform in front of a live audience. It felt great to have the audience enraptured in what was going on, and it's been a, it's been a blast. I think table reads are vital to the uh, the process. The cast and the creatives can all align. I think it's a great unifying factor. They're vital. I, I just, yeah, and I always insist upon them. I don't know if I came in with a ton of expectations, but definitely exceeded all of them when we all rehearsed in person for the first time. I got goosebumps. It's such a different experience. Get those screenplays out into the world. I was almost hesitant. I was like, is it ready? Is it not? But I'm really glad that I hit submit and <laughs> got to be a part of this awesome experience.